Hello and welcome to this lecture on conflict and the overlapping issue of negotiation. These are two different topics which many people see as inextricably intertwined. However, we must realize that not all conflict is bad and that sometimes we want to foster constructive or supportive conflict. Next, we need to realize that how we view negotiations can make a tremendous impact on how well we do in them and how satisfied we are with the process of negotiation. In fact, if we view negotiation as an opportunity to collaborate on a win-win or integrative solution to overcome conflict, we're more likely to have a favorable outcome and a pleasant experience. This lecture should sort out some of this, so let's get started. First, we'll examine this giant conflict process model here. So conflict is the process in which one party simply perceives that its interests are being opposed or negatively affected by another party. So only one party need to feel that there is opposition to them in order for conflict to actually be present. Both parties in the conflict need not perceive that their interests are being opposed. So management thinking about conflict has evolved over the years from a period of time when all conflict was thought to be bad to the modern period in which we actually foster conflict of a certain kind. This is the conflict process model and we'll explore each of these boxes in greater detail. Essentially, it's a causal model in which various sources of conflict cause perceptions about the situation and emotional reactions to the situation, which can lead to the realization of manifest or actual conflict, which can then cycle backward in a reciprocating loop or can proceed to outcomes associated with conflict. So we will blow up each of these boxes and look at details within each of them, starting with the conflict outcomes. If you recall, I said that we sometimes actually foster conflict in the modern workplace, but hopefully that conflict is of a very certain kind. And so let's explore the outcomes associated with conflict. So at the very top, we have positive outcomes in the blue box on the far right hand side there. Positive outcomes are sometimes known as constructive outcomes or alternatively cognitive outcomes or even as functional conflict. So conflict can be positive, constructive, cognitive, and functional. Those terms are interchangeable. Various sources of literature refer to the positive conflict outcomes by those names. It's important that we know them all. Well, some of the positive outcomes of conflict are that it helps us improve our decision making. Ultimately, we tend to have better decisions. It can strengthen team dynamics. Conflict in this set of outcomes should be aimed at the issue, not the parties. And it helps recognize problems, identify solutions, and understand the issues even better. It also is potentially healthy and valuable. So positive outcomes results in better decisions. Positive outcomes results in better responsiveness to the decision. And it can even increase cohesiveness amongst the parties of the conflict if conflict is focused on the issue, not on the parties themselves. Now at the bottom of the blue box, we have negative conflict outcomes. These are sometimes called socio-emotional or similarly, they're referred to as affective. That's A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E, -F affective. And also they're known as dysfunctional conflict. So we have four synonyms for bad sorts of conflict outcomes. Negative, socio-emotional, affective, and dysfunctional. Some of these outcomes include the diversion of energy and resources, which can weaken the process and cause stress. 
This can also increase turnover and organizational politics can rear their ugly head whenever a negative conflict outcome is present, as well as lower job performance and the distortion of information. So think about a conflict that you may have had with a coworker and you became very, very stressed out about it. You just could not come to an agreeable resolution with your coworker over the issue. It stresses you out to no end. You may even have thought about finding another job. So your turnover intentions may have risen. You may even have engaged in a little sabotage of some of their other projects or tried to curry favor with the supervisor in the hopes that the supervisor would settle the solution in your favor. That would be politics. It may even have stressed you out so much that you are taking time away from your other tasks. And so your job performance could be decreased as well. And typically when we filter conflicts through a negative screen, we tend to have a distortion of information. Sometimes we engage in perceptual blocking or perceptual defense or some of those things that we've discussed in earlier chapters. Well, there are some ways, of course, from for minimizing this socio-emotional conflict or negative conflict. One is emotional intelligence. We should be better able to regulate our emotions and we should be able to view others' emotions as information. So as our own emotional intelligence levels rise higher and higher in the four-stage EI hierarchy, then we should be better equipped to recognize the emotions of others and even help them manage their emotions. Another thing that will help minimize this negative conflict would be simply having a cohesive team Cohesive team members tend to engage in negative conflict much less frequently. We have more trust for them. We give them more latitude to make decisions without consulting with us. We tend to understand these other team members even better. And thus we are motivated to minimize the escalation of conflict because we don't want our cohesion to erode. A third way of minimizing socio-emotional conflict is to have supportive team norms. So if our team norms say that we appreciate an honest dialogue without a personal affront, then that would help us avoid negative outcomes. Some norms of some teams might even discourage the display of negative emotions. The rule, so to speak, in our team might be, we do not scream, we do not cry. We do not shout. We do not do any of these sorts of negative emotional displays there. So all of these things are outcomes of conflict. Let's turn now to the far left-hand box, the sources of conflict. Well, the sources are many and varied. And the first one is simply having incompatible goals. One party's goals are perceived to interfere with another party's goals. And this, of course, can sometimes be overcome by simply emphasizing a superordinate goal. So, for example, let's say that you have a goal of handing in your TPS report by 5 p.m. and it must be photocopied in triplicate. And someone else has the same goal of handing in their triplicate form TPS report by five o'clock. And there's only a minute and a half left before five o'clock and only one of you can use the photocopy machine. That is an incompatible goal. Now, what you might have to do is seek to emphasize the superordinate goal. Maybe you say to your coworker, it's clear that only one of us will get all three copies of our TPS report in on time. How about we split it down the middle and each hand in one copy by five o'clock, getting us both in just a tiny bit of trouble, but certainly less trouble than not handing it in at all. And we tell the boss, 
Now we're going to go make the photocopies and the copies will be just a little bit late. We'll each hand in our two copies because we know that the goal of this organization, the superordinate goal, is to have all TPS reports in on time or something like that. Next, we have differentiation. This is simply when we have different values or beliefs than people who are in opposition to us. This can help explain cross-cultural issues in the workplace and even generational conflict. There's a lot of research now on intergenerational conflict in the workplace between baby boomers and so-called millennials or Generation Y members. And the Generation Y member people grew up in an always on, always connected, technologically focused world and the baby boomers did not. And so baby boomers can't understand why it is that young people are tweeting in the workplace or why young people are always on Facebook and why young people use the slang and the jargon that they do. Whereas the younger generation may not understand some of the values of say hard work and work ethic and things like that, that it took the baby boomers to get ahead. So this intergenerational conflict is one example of differentiation. One way to overcome this is by developing common experiences and intermingling the teams. So we put on a team some Gen Y members and some baby boomer members. And if we recall the contact hypothesis, we remember that the more contact we have with disparate others, helps us relieve the anxiety of dealing with them. And we ultimately find out that, you know what? They're not so different. Next on the list would be task interdependence. The degree of task interdependence, if you recall, ranges from pooled to sequential to reciprocal. And so high levels of task interdependence often result in conflict. Now, this can be overcome by creating buffers that can decouple the dependence. So for example, maybe on a sequential process like an assembly line, we simply have some extra stock, some extra parts that are in front of each person at various stage on the assembly line. That way they are never completely, entirely dependent upon the flow of goods down the assembly line from the person upstream, so to speak. So these buffers that decouple dependence can help reduce the conflict associated with task interdependence. Next we have scarce resources. With this, we can have lots of politics that can arise. So the motivation to compete for a resource can cause conflict. If you need that photocopy machine by five o'clock and somebody else is on it, that machine is a scarce resource. So clearly, you know, incompatible goals and task interdependence and scarce resources and all of these different sources of conflict are not standalone sources that are in their own little silos, so to speak. These are sometimes overlapping. Similarly, we have ambiguous rules as a source of conflict. These things tend to create uncertainty and can threaten our goals and our goal accomplishment. So without rules, people simply rely on politics. So if you've ever watched uh, the Survivor TV show, the reality TV show, there's lots of politics going on there because no one has posted rules on the makeshift hut on the island that say, in this TV show, we will do this, this, and this, and not that, that, and that. The rules are made up as you go along. So people tend to rely on favoritism instead of merit and on uh, little um, uh, cabals and uh, secret uh, alliances and things like that because the rules are so ambiguous. Now, clearly a way of overcoming this is by simply clarifying the rules a priori. Clarifying them ahead of time helps overcome ambiguity and reduces politics and therefore reduces conflict. Or you can simply have a transparent policy so if everyone knows how their semi-annual performance appraisal is conducted, on what criteria they will be rated, if they know how their grade, so to speak, is determined, 
this tends to be less of a conflict issue. Now, they may still disagree with the outcome. That is, they could have low distributive justice and high procedural justice, but um, the human mind is able to differentiate between those two forms of organizational justice. The moral of this story is ambiguous rules often cause trouble. And then last but certainly not least here, we have communication problems. Poor communication is an issue in the workplace all the time. If someone is particularly arrogant or they use uh, cryptic language or too much jargon or words that don't, others don't understand, this can lead to stereotyping and can lead to a decrease in communication. And if you think about business, business is not really about money. Business is about people and people communicate. So communication is a vital issue in the workplace, understanding each other, understanding their motives and being able to communicate those motives is essential in reducing conflict. Well, let's move on. Okay, in this particular model, we'll discuss various ways to manage conflict. We all have a predisposition towards one or the other conflict management style. But first and foremost, let's understand the two axes here in this graph. On the horizontal axis, we have the degree of cooperativeness that we wish to engage in. So it ranges from low near the origin of the axes to high on the far right hand side. So if we wish to be very highly cooperative, we're going to use a different style to manage the conflict than if we wish to be very low on the cooperation there. This can be thought of as the degree to which we wish to maintain a relationship with the other party. So this is a very important sort of a diagram. Now, similarly, on the vertical axis, we have assertiveness. This is essentially the desire to win, so to speak. So it ranges from low near the origin to high on the top of the vertical axis there. So some of these styles, of course, start with the avoiding style near the origin of the axes there. And this would be low on cooperativeness and low on assertiveness. So essentially, we don't wish to maintain a relationship with the person, low cooperativeness, and we don't wish to win, low on assertiveness. And so this may be necessary when socio-emotional or negative conflict is extremely high. The problem is that it doesn't resolve the conflict. And this may produce long-term frustration. In essence, we say, I don't care about you. I don't care what happens with the, uh, the issue in hand. I don't care. And you walk away. Now there in the middle of the graph, we have the compromising uh, style. And so the compromising style may be necessary when there is little hope for mutual gain, when both parties have equal power, and when both parties need to settle their differences very quickly. This is the so-called good enough solution, which sometimes tends to overlook even better solutions. So this is the, the happy middle there, like buying a car at a negotiated price or negotiating a salary there. So we give up some on both ends. We give up some of our desire to maintain a relationship and we give up some of our desire to win at all costs. And ultimately it's a slightly suboptimal solution for both parties. Now on the top left, we have forcing. The forcing style is a win at all cost conflict management style. This says I must win and you must lose. This is a zero sum game here. I must win, you must lose, and I will not be cooperative and I do not care about you, nor do I care to maintain a relationship with you in the long run. So low cooperativeness and high assertiveness. This is the, uh, uh, the perfect distributive model. I win, you lose. Now, next we would have the problem solving solution here. Problem solving may be necessary when a true win-win 
solution is possible. This is often best when the only style, this is often the, the best style that seeks an optimal outcome, but communication is key in this style and it's necessary to identify a common ground and solutions that please everyone. So the issue here is how can I maintain the highest level of relationship with you and also make sure that I get exactly everything I'm looking for at the same time you get those things also. So this goes from win-lose with the forcing style to win-win. We both win. Think of the example from the TV show American Pickers where these two guys go around to all of these decrepit warehouses and farms that are overstocked with a bunch of junk and they pick through it and they ask the owner if they'll sell some of it and they usually do it a piece at a time and often when they make a price offer on something and the owner says no 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 I need more than that they say I'll come back to this piece later what I'll do is I'll bundle some other things and so they go and find other things and they say you know that piece we talked about a while ago that you wanted more than I was willing to offer what if I give you X for this piece and Y for that piece and then you throw that piece in that we were talking about earlier at a slightly discounted price and I'll buy all three. Essentially now the picker has gotten the price that he or she wanted and the seller gets to sell more stuff. The seller may have exhausted his relationship with the picker by saying, no, I insist that I get exactly what I'm asking for on every item and we will discuss items one at a time. Well, the person, the picker may say, okay, well, sure, that's all I can afford is this piece now that you're really putting it to me like this. So by coming up with a win-win problem-solving solution there, by bundling all these things and negotiating on them all simultaneously, both parties get what they're looking for. Now, last but not least in this model would be the yielding management style. The yielding management style is when you wish to maintain a relationship with the other person, even if it means you get nothing out of it. So this is the, uh, the uh, um, yes, honey, I'll mow the yard um, so that I can watch the football game with my friends uh, on Saturday. Um, and then she says, well, no, you told me you were going to go to the uh, farmer's market with me on, on the, uh, that day. And so you say, okay, whatever. Um, I love you so much. I'll do everything that you ask. And I don't really care about football anyway. All the while you're gritting your teeth and wondering if your favorite team has won the game or not, or if they can even win without you watching. So in the yielding solution here, you have ultra high cooperativeness and near zero assertiveness. And so this is a problem when the other party has substantial, uh, substantially more power. And so uh, this is uh, like dealing with a new boss at a new job. When you walk in, you certainly don't ask your boss uh, if you can leave early on the first day of work. And in fact, if the boss says, oh, by the way, welcome to the team. I hope you've enjoyed your first day and I hope you can stay um, until, say, 10 p.m. tonight and work with me on this special project. Do you say no? Heck no, you don't say no to the new boss. The boss has more power than you. You yield. You say, I wish to maintain a high quality relationship with my boss therefore I will not be assertive and so in these two examples the new boss is like the wife okay let's move on now we're going to blow up these two boxes in the middle here recalling of course that only one party needs to perceive conflict for it to exist and when it becomes obvious to both parties it then becomes manifest or actual conflict, which is sort of an in-your-face conflict. When this happens, it can escalate out of control in a seemingly perpetual feedback loop where we make bad decisions and we engage in inappropriate behaviors which just escalate 
or even twist our perceptions and make our emotions even more pronounced, which then cause us to adopt a more maladaptive conflict style, engage in even poorer decisions, portray even worse behaviors, etc., etc., etc. So this feedback loop is what we call the conflict escalation cycle. This is where things spiral out of control. Sometimes when they spiral out of control, they're ultimately going to lead to negative conflict outcomes. If we're able to use an appropriate conflict style, maybe it's a yielding, maybe it's a yes, honey, I would love to mow the yard and I can't wait to go to the farmer's market with you this weekend. Maybe that's the conflict style we adopt in order to not have negative conflict outcomes. Maybe we decide to say nothing in the face of the other party's demands on us. Maybe we then engage in appropriate smiling and head nodding behaviors and yes, honey, you're right, you're always right. And of course your mother is right and all the women in your family are right and I wish every woman in the world was just like you. Okay, I'm being kind of facetious here, of course, uh, but this particular manifest conflict can help uh, de-accelerate the conflict escalation cycle. Sometimes when manifest conflict cycles out of control, spirals upward, negatively affects our perceptions and our emotions, and it keeps spiraling out of control, sometimes we have to do something else. So let's move on. Sometimes we have to seek the help of a neutral third party. Now this graph has two axes. The horizontal axis is the level or degree of decision control that we give the third party. It ranges from low, which is essentially none, to high, which is sort of totalitarian. The vertical axis is the level of control over the process that we grant the third party. So ask yourself, do you want to control the exchange of information? Do you want to control uh, or the ability to hide information from your adversary? Do you want to decide on the amount of time under which the exchange will take place, etc., etc.? Or are you willing to give up control of the process to someone else who decides who talks first, who decides for how long, and who decides what supporting documents, if any, will be required for us? So the three types of third-party intervention, which we'll discuss, are these. The first being mediation. Mediation has very low decision control. In fact, most forms of mediation have no decision control. The mediator does not make the decision, but they do have high process control. They can control the exchange of information between the parties. Think about a mediation in a management labor workplace dispute. The mediator can say, I need labor to bring this document, that document, and that document. I need uh, management to bring similar documents. Um, labor will speak first. They get 30 minutes to state their case. Management gets a 10 minute rebuttal. Then management gets 30 minutes to state a different case and labor gets a 10 minute rebuttal. And then I will help you make the decision for yourself. So the mediator, again, does not make the decision. They simply control the process. Well, next we have something called Inquisition. Yes, the Spanish Inquisition is a pretty decent example, I guess. Very high decision control and very high process control. The Inquisitor controls both the process and the decision. For example, this could be a criminal court judge. In a criminal court, if it's trial by judge instead of trial by jury, the judge makes the decision. Guilty? Not guilty. Solely the, the judge's decision. The judge also controls the process. No, that witness is not acceptable. Yes, you may introduce this witness. No, your objection is overruled, so sit down. So the complete process control and create a complete 
decision control would be an inquisition form of third-party intervention. Sometimes bosses in the workplace will take on this particular role when trying to solve a dispute between two subordinates. If the two subordinates both both report directly to the to the boss, to the supervisor, the boss can make the decision and control who speaks for how long and says what. So that's an inquisition third party intervention. Next we have arbitration. In the arbitration role, the arbiter has very high decision control and very low process control. So the arbitrator definitely makes the decision but cannot control the exchange of information since the parties decide a priori beforehand what sources and what kinds of information they will offer. Now, usually this is a binding arbitration, but oddly there can even be sometimes non-binding arbitration, which is very rarely done. Um, labor management disputes are often sent to arbitration uh, Major League Baseball has an arbitration uh, sort of uh, finding and where an arbitrator, a federally approved arbitrator, is brought in to solve contract negotiations. Uh, the team and the player present their evidence, whatever evidence it is that they want to present, and the arbitrator makes the decision. Um, so the best method to use as a third-party intervention depends on the situation. In organizational settings, Inquisition is usually the least effective method and mediation is usually the best method in most workplace settings because then employees feel empowered to create their own solutions. They take psychological ownership of the solution. They say, in effect, we decided this. We must live with the solution. It's our solution and therefore it's our problem and we will live with it. So let's move on. Essentially here, I'd like to say, let's not lock horns at every opportunity. Let's shake hands because when we shake hands, we can form long lasting affiliative bonds with people. And as I said, business is about people and people matter and negotiation and conflict uh, can uh, help ease issues that people thought could potentially cause irreparable harm to uh, people in the workplace. So the evolution of conflict and how we uh, treat conflict in the workplace has decidedly changed. Uh, the moral of this story is to keep your conflict outcomes positive or functional and avoid socio-emotional or affective or dysfunctional conflict. And then everyone can be successful. So that's all folks.